Tonight on Joy News Prime, um, several fishing gears and outboard motors bent as fire guards a landing beach. One person feared dead. We are live on the ground for details for you. Also in this bulletin, former special prosecutor Martin Amidu fights back government's response. He says will push him to reveal what he calls unpalatable truths. My life from the Republic of Ghana, and the president will be responsible for anything that happens to me. I said, Big Larry, okay. they will rob me. Okay. They will burn my house. Look, I am telling you that the intelligence is there. We'll hear from Martin Amedo as he says he will defend his integrity with his life. Also in this bulletin, we'll be uh, going to the National Lottery Authority, which is denying inflating costs as Joy News investigations uncover contracts for purchase of point-of-sale devices in which the state could lose up to $10 million of taxpayers' money. Since the NLA was buying 30,000 pieces, the authority should have been paying $172 per device and not $860. And in business? Director General for the Securities and Exchange Commission has been detailing the payment of bailout funds to customers of defunct fund management firms. If George Uyafi um, has 100000 it means that for this partial bailout, George Uyafi is getting um, 50,000. Well, live from our studio, Cinco Comlemle on digital address GA0992539. Well, live also on DSTV channel 421, Go TV channel 144. And my name is Aisha Ibrahim. Stay with me. Many thanks for choosing us. Remember, we are also free to air because we are on digital terrestrial television. And uh, in our very first story, former special prosecutor Martin Amidu is fighting back what he says are attacks on his person following his resignation this week as special prosecutor. He's warning that the repercussions could be dire if what he describes as the mud slinging against his hard-worn reputation does not stop, adding that even if it cost him his life, he will defend his integrity. Mr. Amidu resigned this week, citing frustrations, interference, and his work in his words, attempts to turn him into a puddle by the president among reasons for his resignation. These claims have since been vehemently rejected by government in a 40-point response. In the following interview, Mr. Amidu responds to claims made by MP for Asin Central Kennedy Japan on the seat a show on Net 2 TV on Wednesday night that the former special prosecutor has a medical problem for which reason he should not have been appointed. Listen. So the allegation is coming for, from uh, an incredible source, a person who has lost all credibility as far as truth is concerned. I mean, Kennedy Ajafon is known in Ghana as somebody who speaks life at any person of integrity who tries to fight corruption. So I am not surprised that he was took that low, you know, to make accusations without any foundation in fact or uh, in truth, I have never been to Germany on any occasion. Let I mean for a medical checkup. I don't know any German hospital or any German clinic, and therefore his allegations are false. He he said he, that he this has, he, he has documents on me having gone for medical treatment in Germany, he should produce them because my passports are available. I have not been to Germany. Indeed, I don't know Germany, let alone to go for a medical treatment. The whole of my trainer from the PNDC in 83 
to when I left office on the 19th, I did not have the opportunity to visit Germany, let alone to visit the medical facility. He, he talks about Muhammad Yariga having had this information before your vetting, but was impressed I mean, upon by John Muhammad. Muhammad Yariga is my son, who, incidentally, I had to lead an investigation again because of public duty. Muhammad Yariga will tell the public that he holds no medical record on me having this state Germany. And I do not think that the attribution to Mama Yarga is true because Mama Yarga will never, and I repeat, never make a, a such false allegations against me as his father. He would have been ostracized by the chiefs and people of the coastal traditional area for such a blatant lie. And I challenged him to get Mama Yarga on the phone to confirm that he had documents proving that I had been to Germany for any type of treatment whatsoever. What would you, what would you do to him? Mama mm. is the person who asked Mama Yarga not to publicize those documents. President Mama is alive, he's not dead. He should speak to it. I mean, I don't know why a simple matter of a Japan realities limited transaction over which I conducted an anti-corruption assessment under law should lead to all these lies being told about me. Yesterday it was that I used an obviously speak up to be punished. I've never had a palm in my life. I've never entered an office pickup in my life. I had my own pickup, and I never found with it. I had my own community, brand new. It's not only 500 kilometers, because I had to use government car and abandon it. The, 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 the wires were eaten by mice. Just last week, I sent it to Gamot, and they put it in proper shape and repair. So what is all this lies? Simply because somebody has performed a professional duty and responsibility. In the next part of the interview you're about to hear, Mr. Amidu says he feel pushed to speak and that his life is under attack. Please, I have said since I left office that I was not going to give any press interview about my resignation. I was not going to talk to the press. I am being pushed. My so-called responses to me, which contains blank and falls to speak. But I do not want anybody to blame me when I speak out and it becomes unpalatable. So either the attack stop or I will defend my integrity, even if that means my death. It is something I won by dint of hard work from the PNDC to date. And I'm not going to allow anybody, not even a president, to pull that integrity into the mind. Why so would you why would a why do you think a sitting MP would make these statements against you, a sitting MP from the incumbent party? And what will you do to him now that you are challenging these claims that, that he has that, made? That, 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 MP has the character of assassinating every responsible person's character, including the judges of the Superior Court. So why would anybody give him credibility? But you see, he has enough money. He owns a radio station, a TV station, and all those things. I am a poor man who has tried to lead a straight and narrow life and crusaded against corruption without asking for payment. So, he will try to destroy me. You know, anybody who tries to fight corruption must be aware from the beginning that corruption will fight back. And all that is going on is corruption fighting back and it's demonstrating when... that the whole rhetoric about fighting 
any corruption. Was near the body. The time for reckoning has come. And nobody should push me. I repeat, nobody should push me. Ghanaians would want to know how you're taking your retirement. And when you say nobody should push you, who can really speak to these people who are pushing you to stop? Well, I'm speaking to you. And they should tell their, 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 their people they have wrongly briefed to be telling lies about me to stop before I decide to respond. And when I, and I, when I decide to respond, I will do so without fear or favor. And all these threats about begging me, I'm robbery, burning my house. I'm aware. I tried to call Kandapa, he didn't pick it. And I got a former national security advisor to, to contact him and tell him. And I know the persons involved, I can name them. I reserve it for the meantime. They are bugging your I house. I my life on the Republic of Ghana, and the president will be responsible for anything that happens to me. I say, big okay. They will rob me. Okay. They will burn my house. Look, I am telling you that the intelligence is there. And I, have, I called the Minister for National Security, he didn't pick it, but I got a former National Security advisor to speak to him. And this fact is now known. And I'm saying that the president will be responsible for anything that happens to me. Are you safe, sir? What? I'm safe. I'm a Ghanaian. I don't fear anything. And as I said, to die in the cause of fighting corruption is what I started with President General Lawrence uh, since 31st December 1981. And I'm not going to leave it because uh, some people think that they can threaten me. I don't give a damn about that. We wish you all the best, sir, and Ghanaians would be waiting to hear you respond to some of the issues that were raised by the presidency when you deem it Well, free. well, I have told you that if they don't stop, I will respond. That was Martin Amidu on an Accra-based radio station, CTFM, uh, Umaru Sanda. There's a follow-up statement from Mr. Amidu. My colleague, Parker Wilson, has a copy of the statement. Parker, what does the statement say? All right, so I shall two quick issues Mr. Amidu raised in his statement. Uh, one, he says that there's an attack on his integrity, uh, which he claims is being led by the president of Ghana, that is Nana Adodamke Kufado. And again, to set the record straight that, in fact, he's never visited Germany before. Mm. And there's, there, there are no records to show that, indeed, he's visited Germany. So I read verbatim to you what the statement says. Now, the first paragraph, which talks about the integrity, uh, says that the concerted efforts led by the president of Ghana and his government to discredit my integrity for producing a professional report on the analysis of the risk of the prevention of corruption and anti-corruption assessment is bound to fail because the Ghanaian of 2020 is not the Ghanaian of 2016 who believed the mere rhetoric of fighting corruption. The attempt to divert attention from the serious suspected breaches of corruption and corruption-related laws disclosed in the anti-corruption assessment contained in the Ejapa report by making false and frivolous allegations against my person will fail because truth shall always triumph over falsehood. That's the first paragraph. Mm. Now, the second paragraph deals with the uh, medical issue as raised by um, uh, the, the, the MP for Asin Central Asin, Canada, Japan. Yes. Now, he says that I have never had any reason or occasion to visit Germany throughout my life, let alone to visit any medical facility on health grounds. The records of my travels, which are available to the Lion in the Japan government, can be checked, and the Germany embassy contacted whether I have throughout my life made any application for a visa or visited Germany. He goes on to say that I was therefore shocked when my attention was called by a reporter from CTFM to one of the usual false allegations typical of the unstable Kennedy Japan, published on Ghana Web today. 19th November 2020, the irredeemable liar par excellence against anybody Ghanaian of integrity who dares to perform his official function to the dissatisfaction of his government was reported to have spoken on his seat show on his Netu TV on Wednesday night, daring me, here referring to himself yeah. as Martin Amidu, mm -hmm. daring me to bring my medical records from Germany to determine whether I am normal. He goes on to say, the unrepentant liar 
attributed to my son, Matinami, uh, uh, Mahama, Mahama Yarga, Yarga, yes, whom I was painfully compelled to investigate in the course of duty in my former position as the special prosecutor, the falsehood that, and here he quotes what Kennedy Japan said. Mm. Ayarga was going to take him on to produce his medical records and explain why he went to Germany. But Muhammad told him to stop. Don't raise this question at the appointment committee, unquote. So and that's so according to Kennedy, Kennedy Japan. Japan. Okay. And, and, and Mr. Ayarga, uh, 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 Martin Amidu is saying that that is untrue. Uh, Muhammad Ayarga does not, does not have any record of him. He's never visited Germany before. And as a matter of fact, there are no records to show that indeed he visited Germany or has even applied for a visa to go to Germany. So what the MP said last night on his show is untrue or perhaps misleading. And that is according to the outgoing special prosecutor, Martin Amidu. And uh, of course, so um, he also talked about, uh, you know, fighting or defending his integrity with his life. Does he state that also, how he intends to do that in that statement? Well, that he indicated to the public and in the statement that uh, government should not push him because they are evidence abound to show that indeed he has integrity still intact. And so if they push him to the wall, uh, definitely he will come back with some unpalatable truth that may hurt the government going forward. And so he's asking them not to dare him at all or to push him to the wall. Because, but if they do, then definitely he has no choice but rather to come out and say what he has to say. Mm. And in the last few minutes, uh, the director of communications at the presidency has been uh, posting stuff on his Facebook. And I'll read excerpts of what he posted on his Facebook. He says the attention of the office of the president has been drawn to claims by Mr. Martin Amidu, the former special prosecutor of threats made against his life since his resignation from office. The president has thus directed the inspector general of police to provide Mr. Amidu immediately with 24-hour police protection. And it goes on to say the former special prosecutor is also encouraged to assess the police with details of persons who have made these threats against his life so that they can be dealt with in accordance with the laws of the country. Certainly, this is a matter that will not rest now. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of that um, as the days unfold. Yeah, but, but it is also worthy to note that uh, the interview we just played, uh, Mr. Amdi himself indicated that he doesn't want any police protection. It was clear okay. in his mind when he was speaking to Omari that uh, even though he sees some threats, uh, what he believes is that government must provide security for all Ghanaians. Mm. He doesn't want a special security okay. for him. He, don't, he doesn't want anybody in his house. So it is quite interesting that uh, the, the presidency is has offering issued a statement that they are offering protection. Police right. protection. But does he state specifically the kind of who is uh, issuing these threats? So no, well, he didn't mention, but he says that people within government, I mean, but uh, MPP supporters, he, he didn't mention names. But he, he claims that he had already made complaint to individuals within national security that these are the threats I have received so far since I made the, the report public or decided to resign uh, from my position as a special prosecutor. And so I am telling you, and one of his statements, he indicated that if anything happens to him, we should hold the president responsible for mm. that. The coming days will be interesting uh, because uh, of the events unfolding. And I look forward to how this issue will be resolved, especially as we are during up to elections. The NBC has also been making statements uh, throughout the day. We'll be getting you um, the issues from the NDC, the concerns raised by the NDC. But uh, several fishing gears and outboard motors um, have been bent and we'll be bringing you details after this break. Welcome back to Joy News Prime. To the rest of our story, several fishing gears and outboard motors have been bent following a fire outbreak at the London site at the second D Takrade Naval Base. Here is an eyewitness account. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been then. I've been since second day. Yo, 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 y
Nihunde, Na bendo obi ewu obi pra na so because <laughs> din wa 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 ma Okay, what Join us is learning one person is feared dead. Inathalia Kwansa is on the ground and joins me on phone. Inathalia, um, I need you to quickly summarize what uh, the gentlemen were talking about uh, before we get on to the interview. Okay, Gifty. So um, it is reported that um, a gang of fishermen were filling their drums for the next fishing expedition. And so some of the premix fall dropped on the floor and there was a fire from some fishmongers who were cooking close by, and that sparked um, the fire. Uh, it's raised, it started raging from around 4 p.m. this evening. And then there, we had six fire attenders. As I speak to you now, they brought the situation under control. We understand that uh, one man is, is a fear from any hospital. I have personally spoken to the PRO of the Ghana Fire Service, who said these are allegations. Uh, they've also had it, but they have not received confirmation from the hospital. So, um, what's the latest uh, on the um, the de the person who's who has been confirmed dead? Well, you see, I understand from um, people around, from my witness, that as uh, he uh, fire caught, he was in the midst of fire, so uh, he's badly bent, still at the hospital. And so they have not gone there to visit him yet. They would only give confirmation as to he's still alive or not. That is when they visit him at the hospital. I understand that other two people were also bent. One of them got bent from his knee, from his toe to his knee. And then the other one also got some bends on his hands. Do we know the uh, amount of uh, or the sum of property damaged? If we, can you come again? Do we know how much of property is damaged? No, Gifty, for now, they are unable to tell. In Afalia Kwanza is our correspondent in the Western region. Now, a Joy News investigation has revealed that the nation stands to lose up to $10 million in a National Lottery Authority contract for the supply of point of sale terminals. The contract with Tech Start Africa is for the purchase of Nexco and five point of sale devices to expand the operations of the NLA. But Joy News discovered that while the product was sold at between $170 and $344, the National Lottery Authority agreed to purchase its device at almost $850. Techstart Africa has already supplied 5,000 of the devices to the NLA for which the authority in December 2018 authorized the release of 20.4 million cities into an escrow account of tech company. There's more in the following report. According to the document available to Joy News, the price of the product appears to have been significantly inflated. In a letter dated October 23, 2018, which was to be sent to the Director General for signing an onward transmission to the PPA, the price of the Nesgo N5 Smart POS terminal was pegged at $207 per device. According to this letter, the cost of the 30,000 Nesgo N5 POS terminals was $6,238,423. The company compared this price to the previous point-of-sale devices procured by the NLA and argued that the price of the Chinese product compares favorably with these, 
given the proprietary features available for the e-kiosk project and its dual functionality for both lottery operations and the VAS platform. The devices previously bought by the NLA were Ingenito, bought at $365 each, and TPS300, which is currently being used by the NLA, bought at $440 each. These devices were procured in 2010 and 2015. Join News obtained an invoice from Shenzhen Technology in October 2019. The price range given on the invoice was $172.260 per device depending on the number of terminals one was buying. The specifications given mirror exactly what was offered by the NLA. According to this invoice, a buyer who is taking less than a thousand pieces of the N5 terminals would be required to pay $260 per terminal. If the buyer was acquiring more than 10,000 pieces, however, a terminal would cost $172 per device. Therefore, since the NLA was buying 30,000 pieces, the authority should have been paying $172 per device and not $860. It should be noted that the $172 is FOB Hong Kong, Textart Africa, quoted $650 or $637 if you consider the 2% reduction in price as your FOB Hong Kong price per device. Meanwhile, the National Lottery Authority is disputing details of investigative piece. A press statement released by the Public Relations Unit of the Authority described the investigative piece as baseless without any IOTOL fruit. There's more in the following report. It says the National Lottery Authority NLA is very disappointed at the unprofessional and unethical conduct of Joy News and Joy FM and Multimedia Group Limited over unfair, untrue and biased reports on the procurement of Nexgo Android point-of-sale terminals by the authority. First and foremost, the whole content of the documentary is baseless and without any iota of truth. It is never true that the cost of the Android point-of-sale terminals were inflated by the Director General of the National Lottery Authority as alleged by the Joy News Joy FM Multimedia Group Limited. It is also never true that the National Lottery Authority has procured 30,000 Android point-of-sale terminals. The Public Procurement Authority gave approval to the authority to procure 30,000 point-of-sale terminals, but according to financial strength of the authority, only 5,000 out of the 30,000 point-of-sale terminals have been purchased. The cost and negotiations for the award of contract to the manufacturer, Shenzhen Zingudu Technology Limited, was approved by the Public Procurement Authority. The Public Procurement Authority directed the NLA to negotiate for a 5% discount on the contract sum prior to the award of the contract to Shenzhen Jingudu Technology Limited. However, due to the inability of the local partner of Shenzhen Jingudu Technology Limited to offer the 5% discount as requested by Public Procurement Authority, the PPA therefore directed the National, Authority, uh, National Lottery Authority to go for a 3% reduction instead. The Public Procurement Authority tasked the manufacturer, Shenzhen Jingudu Technology Limited, and its local partner to deliver the point of sale terminals to the NLA through delivery duty paid DDP if Joy News Joy FM Multimedia Group Limited understands what is DDP with the greatest of respect they would not have come up with this bogus documentary of cost inflation however their ignorance cannot be forgiven and coming up in business, SEC details payment plans for uh, customers of defunct fund management companies. Details when Charles IJ takes over. If George Uyafi um, has 100,000, it means that for this partial bailout, George Uyafi is getting um, 50,000.
Hello, good evening. It's time for business. I'm Charles Aite. Now, payment of government bailout funds for some customers of the defunct fund management firms are expected to commence next week. Now, this is, however, subject to these customers meeting some critical conditions that are expected to aid the payment program. Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Reverend Daniel Ogbamiteche, has been speaking to engaging investors on development in the industry and the entire payment plan. Again, to make it clear, we say it's a partial bailout. Partial bailout because there's a clear bailout package that has been agreed upon, which was rolled out uh, at the end of September when we had the uh, 22, uh, 22 firms that were um, under official liquidation, the official liquidator had met them. So there's a, a bailout package, mm -hmm. but because the liquidation order or orders are yet to be um, you know, granted for a number of these outstanding ones, we say, okay, this is a partial or an interim relief that is being provided. So the, the plan is that as and when the liquidation orders are granted, then the full bailout package will be triggered. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the full bailout package has X amount in tier one and then Y amount in tier two based on the category mm -hmm. in which you find yourself below 60, more than 60 and so on and so forth. So once the liquidation orders are granted, then the affected claimants will fall into the uh, bailout package as currently designed. So, so that really it, 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 doesn't mean that there could be a situation where a judge of my heart about a hundred thousand Ghana cities outside this whole process, but it's just going to get fifty thousand first, and then later when everything is clear, it will fall in line with the tier one, the tier two as well. Absolutely, that, that's all I'm saying. So, if George Uyafi, um has hundred thousand, it means that for this partial bailout. George Uyafi is getting um, 50,000. Now, after the liquidation order, if George Uyafi is less than um, 60 years, and looking at you, I think you are less than 60 years. <laughs> if George Uyafi is less than 60 years, then George Uyafi will have an additional 20,000 in uh, tier one and the remaining 30,000 will be in tier two mm. because that is the current uh, design of the bailout. If you are below 60, you get up to 70,000 in tier one and then the remainder in tier two. Mm. So, so that is the plan. You may want to stay with us, especially as SEC rolls out this payment plan. We shall be giving you details as and when we do have them. But away from that, Finance Minister Ken Oforeta has indicated that government is planning to use the 100 billion CD Ghana Cares program to facilitate the economy's recovery post COVID 19. Now, this initiative is expected to fully take off from next year. Of course, among other things, commercialize agriculture, industrialize the economy, and make Ghana a hub for goods and services. Ken Oferiata spoke with Joy Business after the launch of the program here in Accra. Significant day for us um, as a country. This is um, an investment to the tune of um, 100 billion Ghana cities, which is a quarter of our GDP. I think never in our history um, has any government had um, uh, the vision and audacity um, to have such a proclamation. Um, we expect that to God willing um, in the next administration um, to truly launch that as a way of transforming the country and creating Ghana as a regional hub uh, for industry, for agriculture, for logistics, uh, for financial services, etc. Well, I mean, we come back to the issue of the two fish and five loaves. Eh? And uh, what is the multiply effect when a people have spirit and resilience? Um, what we are expecting is that 30 billion will be uh, from the public sector and 70 billion from the private sector, which will require strong partnerships around the world and creating Ghana as really the commercial center for Africa. We'll be able to do that. Um, 
Uh, I'm not sure it's accessing the program in terms of the money. Um, on the private sector part, that is getting partnership, FDIs, etc., for that to happen. Uh, on the government part, is increased revenue mobilization uh, in whichever way we can have it, and using those resources um, to support um, an economic framework um, that is supportive, especially of indigenous enterprises. Mobile firm Nissan has announced it will commence assembling of its vehicles from the third quarter of next year. This was after it formally settled on Japan Motors as its local partner to assemble these vehicles. The managing director, Salem Kalmoni, has been speaking to my colleague, George Rafi. We're excited that we have got it. It wasn't expected. It wasn't automatic. Uh, two other companies wanted uh, to have the, 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 niece, the appointment as assembly in Ghana, and Japan Motors was uh, the third. And uh, there was due diligence. They came, they visited us. They, we had, they looked at our financials. They looked at our history. And as you know, Japan Motors had a long history. And after that, Nissan decided that no, the uh, appointment will be to Japan Motors, yes. So what are you going to bring onto the table? I mean, we knew you as a, a distributing outlet. Yes. Now you're moving into assembling. Do you have the expertise to do yes. this? Oh, that's a good question. And if you were there yesterday, okay, we've done it before. We were assembling vehicles, uh, Nissan vehicles, from 1968 all the way to, I think, 79, 80, when we stopped. So we were assembling vehicles. We have the, uh, uh, yes, we know what it takes. Um, and what we're bringing in is the, the facilities, a great location, which is in Tema, you need to be very close to the, to the port because you're getting uh, uh, containers. Um, and number two, you, it's it's good that when you assemble, you also have uh, you're you're very good. You have the distribution network, uh, the branches. Uh, in, in, in the country. Well, just before we leave, lottery firm Star 787 Hash has rewarded its 46th unique prize winner with 20,000 cities in cash. There's more in this report. Smith here with the sport. Thank you for your time. And in our first story, the impasse between the Ghana Football Association and Asante Kotoko continues as the Porcupine Warriors demand their pound of flesh in the matter that has to do with recording their own games. Now, the Porcupine Warriors have written to the Ghana Football Association and they have asked Star Times to take their money back and they've asked the GFA also to do more as we explain in this report. When Kumasi Asante Kotoko played against the Chiman 11 Wonders on Sunday night, their 2020-21 Ghana Premier League season opener kicked off was delayed by 11 minutes. The delay was as a result of a disagreement between Kotoko and the GFA officials over the former's rights to videotape the game. Additionally, the Porcupine Warriors showed receipts of payment they had made to the GFA, giving them permission to shoot the game with their own cameras. Per Article 42.5 of the Premier League regulations, clubs can pay to record their matches. The GFA, on the other hand, insisted the only cameras allowed to shoot the game were those of the official broadcasters of the league, Star Times, and asked Kotoko to take the video from Star Times after the game if they so badly needed it. Kotoko threatened to boycott the game, but subsequently rescinded the decision and the recording went ahead along with the game. On Tuesday, the GFA, in order to avoid further confrontation, refunded Asante Kotoko the money they paid to the association to grant them permission to record their games an amount of 1,700 Ghana series for 34 matches. Kotoko are also believed to be unhappy with having to pay 3,500 Ghana series for fueling the generator at the Accra Sports Stadium for their evening game. Club's officials are furious they have been made to bear an extra cost because of a shadow they are not responsible for putting together. The preceding events angered the club's top hierarchy who immediately swung into action. First, they have vowed to refund the Star Times' broadcast money so they can have absolute control over videoing their games. According to Joy Sports sources, clubs are expected to receive the first tranche of Star Times money on Monday, November 23, an amount of $10,000 which Asante Kotoko intends to refund fully to the GFA 
freeing them of any obligation to have their home games covered by Star Times. Optionally, Kotoko will now consider the option of broadcasting their home games on a paid streaming platform, Seek, which the club signed a three-year partnership agreement with. The steps of Kotoko has been supported by at least seven clubs, according to Joy Sports sources. This has forced the Ghana Football Association to convene stakeholders' meeting with CEOs next week, Monday. Let's go international. And Castor Semenya has previously seen her appeals dismissed at the sports highest court and the Swiss Supreme Court. Now she will appeal to the European Court of Human Rights to challenge regulations that require her to artificially lower her natural testosterone levels. Her defense team will take the case to Strasbourg and Semenya is hopeful of qualifying for the Olympics in the 200 meters. And that's the spot for now. Thank you for your time. I'll be back on the other side of eight with more. And it's time for showbiz. Becky is here. Yeah, <laughs> Becky, I miss you so much. Me Good too. to see you. Oh, you look so cute today. <laughs> and you too. I Wearing the same hair. Yeah, kind of <laughs> funny. Except you are not in a uh, mask. So, okay. Uh, let, let's talk about, you know, celebrities campaigning for peace ahead of the elections. We have Stoneboy, uh, who is, uh, will be doing something on the 28th. Of November, um, in a shaman, it, he calls it the Unity Health Walk. Okay. So, uh, some of the things that she should be looking forward to before the election, some of the things that celebrities are doing. Mm -hmm. Wendy Shea, on the other side, is also uh, organizing a cleanup exercise inside Nima. Uh, this is just to uh, tell everybody else that we need peace in the country mm -hmm. ahead of the elections, before and uh, during and after. The elections. Uh, also, uh, we have. Oh, why is Ekia Donko's flag not there? I can't. Oh, Ekia flag is not Donko's there. Flag. I think they forgot. <laughs> That's a message that you should change the flyer and make sure that Ekia Donko's uh, flyer or, or yeah, flag, flag features yeah, there. Features <laughs> on there. So uh, that's also about it. Let's talk about Yao Sapon. He's also uh, launched a, a peace song. Mm you know, ahead of the 2020 elections. We have uh, excepts from that. Of course, we need peace in this election. Of course, yeah. Uh, but, um, well, I haven't spoken to you about e-vibes, you know. Mm -hmm. Have you seen Have you seen it on Joy Prime? No. Uh, the one with the Honourable Minister, Kujo Ponkroma. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, that was lovely. I mean, yeah. I mean, anybody else would want to watch that. But what's coming up? Uh, you have something with Akwabwa, right? Oh, no. Um, Actually, Honorable Minister has a favorite. You know, he doesn't come across as somebody who listens to music or loves entertainment. Okay. But it turns out that he has a favorite in the music industry. So uh, ahead of, you know, the showing this Saturday, 8.30 a.m. on Joy News. Okay. Uh, he's been speaking. Here are excerpts. Music. I love music. I like um, a lot of uh, hip life. Mm. Um, I like a bit of high life as well. And then I like the Afrobeats that the Nigerian boys are doing between Amaka and Dumebi and um, uh, all of those ones. And then there's this one by Two Face where he says the girl is deceiving him on Instagram. Um, it's a racist. Anytime I call you, you say you day, Paja. Mm. Anytime I call you, say you day, my area. I say no, Wahala. No, that's Amaka as well. Yes. Um, and then I think currently what I'm listening to is um, Aquabua and Floating Stone, Stone, Blow My Mind. Um, where's my phone? If I can find my playlist for you. Okay. So it is currently what's on my playlist. Yeah. And you sing that when... Yeah, that's my current number one. It's starts to blow my mind. I'm sure you know it. Yeah, so who's, who's blowing your mind? <laughs> <laughs>And of course, that's why you have to look forward to watching it. That's Saturday, 8.30 a.m. A.m., Before yes, News File. So, I mean, e Vibe actually preps you for News, news File. file. Yes. I can't wait to watch that interview. But that's it. For those of you watching on Joy Prime, that'll be it. Uh, the news continues on Joy News.
The National Democratic Congress is calling on moral society and traditional authorities to speak against what they call the tyranny of government of uh, President Ekofuado. At a news conference Thursday, National Communications Office of the NDC, Sami Jemfi, in spite of his party's difference with Martin Amido, whilst in office, his life was never threatened. The NDC has been speaking about the resignation of Martin Amido as special prosecutor and the allegations by Martin Amido that there are threats to his life following his corruption risk assessment report of the HAPA deal. No voices of conscience in moral society, traditional authorities and civil society to rise up and condemn the tyranny and totalitarianism being supervised by President Ekufuado under the XWAL NDC Mills administration and the NDC Mahama regime. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to this carefully. Martin Amidu, under these two NDC governments, went about his anti-corruption activities in peace. Even though we disagreed with him on many issues, neither President Mills of blessed memory, nor President John Dramani Mahama, nor their appointees attempted to interfere with Martin Amidu's work as citizen vigilante in any way. No one attempted to influence him or induce him in any way. No one visited his house to induce him to cover up their crimes. And no one, more importantly, threatened him with death, arson, or robbery. So why is this man being threatened with arson, robbery, and death by the MPP? for professionally discharging his statutory duties as special prosecutor. It is evil to appoint a man as special prosecutor, refuse to pay him for two years, deliberately starve his office of the basic resources necessary for his work. And when he indicts you for corruption, turn around and threaten him with death. That is the height of wickedness. And like I said, it is sad that this country has sunk this low. The Northeast Regional Minister Solomon Boa says plans are underway to resource the Regional Police Command to effectively execute its mandate going into the December polls. The Northeast Regional Police Command has only six police vehicles, one of which was recently involved in an accident killing one police officer. Now, this is a region which has recorded several armed robberies in recent times. The minister was responding to demands by electorates there to resource the police ahead of elections. But first, listen to a report from our Northeast Regional Correspondent, Elias Otanko, on electoral hotspots. The Northeast Region has had notable existing threats from chieftaincy and ethnic clashes to armed robbery, which all point to proliferations of arms. Concerns are raised. This will make it difficult for security agencies here to contain situations that may arrive at the 60 identified electoral hotspots during and after the elections. For many, the phenomenon of politically connected people being left off the hook dampens the hope of violence-free election. And to arrest one party member, the guard, allergies and imams, they will go and, and talk on behalf of the man because they are having political decisions in it. So there has not been notable recent political violence in the northeast region, but in Waliwali -Wali alone, where Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia will be voting on December 7th, police has identified at least 30 electoral hotspots. Residents are worried about increasing activities of the gunmen as the elections approach. From from Wale -Wale to Bukhe is also not safe. So we are just appealing to the municipal chief executive, the security council, the commander in the Walewale municipal to just give up the security because we are in the election year and the Christmas tree is around the corner. We are now in the jungle. Each time they are robbing. Aside from them, market women and mobile money vendors have also become easy targets for armed robbers here in Walewale. We managed here to survive and so 
anytime they attack us is always a big worry to us. Failure to close as early as possible, you might be attacked by, by armed robbers. The city is not safe. Okay. The residents look up to the police, but the police in this region are ill-resourced. The Yunyu and Yagaba district, for example, have no police stations, and for a population of nearly 600,000, there are just about six police vehicles. Information available to Joy News indicate patrol duties in the area have been suspended after one of the vehicles was involved in an accident in which one officer died with three others severely injured. With these armed attacks mostly yet to be unraveled, the fear here is the guns used and many others are still within the reach of the people and that could be bad considering the 60 electoral hotspots here in the northeast region. Ilias Sutanko reporting for Joy News. But the regional minister assured the electorates that vehicles and other resources needed to beef up security will be provided to the police by next week. He spoke to Gift and Appear on the polls on the Joy News channel. As we speak, we are in touch with uh, the Interior Ministry and then the, the Inspector General of Police. The last time, it's essentially the President was here for the Damba Festival. Such an appeal was made by the overlord of the Montpugu traditional area. And I can assure you that the Presidency and, the, and that of the Interior Ministry and IGP for that matter are really uh, working hard. And I can assure you that within, this, uh, the, within the next two or three days, we are going to get more vehicles into the region to support the police to, 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 to be able to arrest uh, this situation. And there are arrangements available to make sure that as in times of election, agencies, mm. departments always also come in to support, to make sure that vehicles are made available. But we are not going to rely on that. We want something that is sustainable. That is the more reason why the, the government of the day is uh, working hard to ensure that Within the next week, Hello, Mr. everything Boa. is put in place here. Mr. Boa, um, you, you, I, I like the point you made about more vehicles coming into the region. You said in the next two or three days, more vehicles yes. are coming for the police. How many vehicles? You said we're talking to the Interior Ministry. How many vehicles are coming and what else are being done? The, 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 the last RedSec meeting that we had, which we'll be, we'll be having now, uh, the, the, the last RedSec meeting, this is just about the, a week ago, uh, the indication... I got from the regional police command is that if we are able to get three or four additional vehicles, very solid ones to add to the fleet of vehicles that we have, they are very sure that at least they will be able to uh, do what is needful as far as uh, stemming down uh, the ills that comes with uh, major events like uh, okay. the, the, the elections. Right. So this is what we are expecting from mm. the IGP and the Interior Ministry for that matter. The former President, uh, Flight Lieutenant J.J. Rawlings, Asante, you know, Tumfo Seichu, the second, says the former President Rawlings, until his demise, had cordial relationship with former President John Ejekumko. For his comment, allays a long-standing perception of a feud between the two Two former leaders of the country, family of uh, ex-president J.J. Rawlings, visited the Menshia Palace in Kumasi to inform the Asantehene of the demise of the former president. Nanai Aljima has more in the following report. The delegation of five was led by Ambassador Victor Gbahu, together with the children of the ex-soldier Zanito and Kimathi Ajman Rawlings. Others include Johnny Blagoji and Michael Susudis. Ambassador Gbahu officially broke the news to the Asante Hini. President John Jerry Rawlings departed this life after a short illness. We have been asked to bring this sad news to Otunfo today. It is the third time that we are appearing here in six weeks, but we ask forgiveness and uh, I hope that uh, we, the effect on all of us will be uh, one that uh, will bring us together. 
The Asante Hene described the late former president as a brother who did his part to develop the country despite ascending the presidency through a coup d'etat. He recounted the cordial relationship between former president J.J. Rollins and J. Kufo. Yo. <laughs> In the book of condolence, the Asantini wrote, Ajiwidi, fare thee well, my president and brother. For Joy News, Nana Ojima reporting. May so rest in perfect peace. The National Democratic Congress in the Northeast region has officially informed the overlord of the Manpuku traditional area, Na Buhagu Abdullahi Mahami Shariga, of the passing of former President George John Rawlings. The late former president was a sub chief at the Nairi and Skin Chief of Brightness, a chieftaincy title he earned from Na Gamni for his rural electrification initiative, which saw the extension of power to the northern regions of Ghana. Elias Tanko has more. The work which occurred in Nalirku, the capital of the Northeast region, saw dozens of party supporters clad in red and black attire and holding large banners designed in party colors. Singing local dirges mixed with party songs, the supporters marched to the palace of the Mampugu overlord to inform the Mampurgu Traditional Council of the death of Jerry John Rawlings as recommended by tradition. Regional Secretary of the party, Ibrahim Tia, explained. It's a, it's a memorial work in honor of our founder, the former president, Jerry John Rawlings, who passed on. We've gone to the palace to inform the palace about his demise. He was enskinned in Nalerugu as the chief of Zinia Arana. That means he's a subject of the palace, which we really need to get the Nairi informed about his passing on. As a result, we've moved with our PC, our council of elders, our regional executives, constituency executives, party activists across the length and breadth of uh, the constituency in the region to also present a donation to the Baptist Medical Center in honor of our fallen hero. The overlord of Mampurugu, Nabuhaga Shariga II, said he was saddened by the death of Jerry John Rawlings and prayed for his soul. The overlord also prayed for the party and eight executive in his region and wished them well. From the chief palace, the supporters marched to the Baptist Medical Center, where the leadership of the party donated hand-washing detergents to the facility. And so on the former president, Upper West Regional Minister, Dr. Hafiz bin Saleh, has eulogized him, uh, stating that he occupies an important place in the history of the Upper West Region. He noted it was in the era of the Provisional National Defense Council, chaired by ex-president Rawlings, that the region was carved out of the then Upper Region, which opened up the region for development. Dr. Bin Sali made the statement when he signed the Book of Condolence, opened at the Regional Coordinating Council as part of activities to mourn the former president. Here's a report by Joy News's Upper West correspondent for Fix The people of the Upper West Region for years have longed to have a region of their own. The region used to be part of the then Upper Region. Between 1960 and 1983, the people of the area, led by the chiefs, youth groups, and student activists, have lobbied all governments 
that rule the country on the need to create a separate region out of the then upper region. All came to naught until the emergence of the Provisional National Defense Council. In the opinion of former Council of State member Guluna said Brema, several people fought for the creation of the region. However, President Rawlings and the PNDC stood out. I'm not forgetting that others have earlier on made efforts in every uh, particular situation. People made efforts. They're just like chasing uh, a wild deer. Fortunately, at the end of the day, whoever claps it down, maybe, will be the hero. Or just playing football, 11 players. But at the end of the day, whoever put the, bo uh, the, the, the ball into the net becomes the goal scorer. So Rollins was the goal scorer. The Upper West Region was created on January 13, 1983, based on the aforementioned and in line with the government's directive of the country's flags flying at half mass, a book of condolence was therefore opened at the conference room of the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council for the people of the region to sign. Leading the charge is the region's 21st Regional Minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali. He led members of the Upper West Regional Security Council and municipal and district chief executives in the region to sign the book of condolence. First Lieutenant Jerry John Rollins was a president of this country, but for us in the Upper West Region, he occupies a very important place. In Reservoirs and shore water is available, especially in times of dire need. The challenge, however, arises when users inadvertently leave the commodity to overflow and waste away, resulting in shortages at crucial moments. A teaching assistant at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Technology is providing a solution by developing a water control and management system. On Tech Thursday, Lava FM Squissy Deborah speaks with the developer on how the technology works. Abdullah Mohammed Zainuddin, an aerospace engineering graduate, is CEO of ABZ Automations. The tech startup seeks to eliminate manual repetitive tasks through the development of hardware and software solutions aimed at specific tasks. Their flagship product, known as the Auto X. The Auto X, it is an automatic water control and management system. Um, this product, it has two basic functions. One is to prevent your tank from overflowing when it's full and the other is to automatically pump water into your tank when you run low on water. The inspiration behind this product is that um, once I was speaking with my auntie and she recalled a, an ordeal that she went through. She stays at Kenyase and she works at town in Katia. So she said once she turned on her pump and she forgot to turn it off and she was in a hurry to go to town. She alighted from the car and she received a call from the neighbor that the tank is overflowing. So she had to take another car and return home just to do what turn off the water pump. So when she told me this, I felt really bad, the number of customers that she might have missed. So I said, okay, why not, um, from what I've learned at the university, the basic engineering, why not come up with something that would be able to do this simple act of turning on or off a switch. That is where I got my inspiration and I teamed up with, uh, I teamed up with a couple of friends to come up with this um, product we call AutoX. So um, AutoX derives knowledge from electrical stroke, electro electronics engineering and um, mechanical engineering. So what it does is we have sensors that are installed on this tank and their duty is to measure the level of the tank. So we have two predetermined levels. One is at the topmost level and one is um, almost mid of the tank. So what happens is when the water gets up to the top level that we've set, it sends a signal to a controller which is down there and the controller would understand that the tank is full. So it will turn off the pump to prevent overflow. And then the other one, which is almost at the mid level, um, when the water gets below it, 
it sends a signal to the controller that you know what the tank is getting low on water so you have to get us some water so it will turn on the pump and it will fill the tank so this process would reiterate itself so far abdullah has installed the product in many parts of the ashanti region we see Deborah with Thick says they will take a break on Joy News Prime. We'll be back shortly with more in business and sports. Hello there, we're back with business. Now, government has launched the Ghana Quick Response Payment System aimed at boosting the administration's drive towards a cash-light society. The Vice President, Mahmoud Baumia, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, tried out the QR code system at a popular watcher joint here in Accra, where he said it will be fast track the, it will fast track the realization of building an all-inclusive economy. Latifa Juice has more in this report. <laughs> okay, don't wanna. Let's let's see how how much is it? Antimony. How much is it? Six days it is. Six days it is. Hey. <laughs> 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 so the current administration championed by the vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, has over the past three years been trumpeting and pursuing a course of a cashless society in Ghana. Today, vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, has added another layer to that course by officially launching the Ghana Quick Response Payment System. Watch as the vice president uses the QR code to buy his favorite watch here at Antimonis Joint here at Ridge. So this is it. Oh, it's so fast. It's it, done already. It's, it's done, done already. already. So we paid you paid it twice. No, we haven't paid. Oh, okay. We haven't confirmed yet. Mm -hmm. That is so sixty. Okay. Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Then I'll confirm payment. Timothy, check to see if you have. We are solving a major problem here in Ghana, and it is historic because Ghana will be the first country in Africa to launch a quick response code payment system. And not only are we the first country in Africa, we are also, as far as I'm aware, the third country in the world to do a universal quick response code after Singapore and India. And however, Singapore and India, their QR codes only cater for bank customers. Ghana's QR code will cater for both bank and non-bank customers. That is the mo those who use mobile money as well as have bank accounts. So in this regard, Ghana's QR code is re unique and is the first of its kind in the world. You know, and so we have to be rightfully proud as Ghanaians that we are using technology to solve a problem uh, that exists in our, in our society, but in doing so, we are really leading the world in this, in this, in this manner. We are leading the world. For the CEO of Gibbs, uh, all the necessary security measures have been put in place to ensure that criminal minds do not take advantage of this initiative to dupe merchants and their customers. In terms of the uh, safeguard to mitigate against fraud, I've actually mentioned one. From the system's point of view, um, these are things that we have taken uh, uh, measures to ensure that our, in terms of transacting, transmitting, all the uh, uh, international standards protocols have been ob ob observed. And we are very confident that uh, from the fraud level, we are, we, are, we are safe and sound, yes. So the next level is to get the informal sector. Right. The next level is to roll it out. So that's why the Vice President rightly encouraged all one individuals to go and link their bank accounts, mobile money wallets to their GHQR code. And secondly, all the merchants to go to their various 
payment service providers, be it a bank or a mobile uh, money network or a fintech, to be issued with a GR, uh, a GH QR code. For your favorite watch seller, Antimony, this is the way to go. You as I say, no, you are a man, you are a man, to be a man, you are a man, but you are a man, you are a man, you are a man, you are a you are a man, you are a man, you are a man, and I shall say, no, we will pass saying apart from the vice president, who been so about and so be you so cure could not to it. Nipper, 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 we any in a cash physical no never in a contempt and I never in our shanka a month. When I yeah, I am so sad. I am you say no. Oh, bend if you say when I am you, we are well, what could you use it? It gets a beer or a beer and a vaca a beer. Won't you mean call you? That's our time, quite dear. Oh, what could you use it? Oh, what are the over top? I can imagine it will be a very good day for Auntie Monet. We're just hoping it doesn't skyrocket her prices at her watch joints. Indeed, good pursuing the cashless agenda by the president, the vice president as well. But away from that, lottery firm Star 787 Hash has rewarded its 46th unique prize winner with a whopping 20,000 cash prize. There is more in this report. The winner, Isaac Sandiford Jam, a machine operator at Kaswa Kuwait, in the greater Accra region was flooded with so much joy when Star 787 Hash team surprised him in his house with his cash prize. He had this to say to Joy Business. Yeah, me dey amia say, kaka me ka che omu nyina ni say, Kuwait for obi a ohwe me, obi a otie me kan soa, but you are a Ghana for nyina, obi a ohwe me, obi a otie me bia say, Star 787 Hash enya za eye nokure because the way I'm young, I mean, you're watching you for the men who is a and yaza into be and fan who is him. They are correct. Richard Akotobanfo, head of customer experience of Star 787 Hash, has admonished Ghanaians to be part of their lottery to get a chance to win big. You stand a chance to win 900,500 Ghana cities this Saturday. All you have to do is to buy a ticket at a cost of five Ghana cities per. What are you waiting for? Win 900,500 Ghana cities and watch us locate you to surprise you with your money. Star 787 hash. It is your moment to win big. So take the opportunity to play now. Well, the Ghana Revenue Authority has assured that its digitization and optimization systems are being implemented and that the challenges associated with, associated with filing for tax reliefs will be resolved. My colleague Emma Davis has more in this report. According to the Head of Compliance and Debt Management, Victor Akogo, the challenges associated with the filing of tax reliefs is due to the manual system. He is however hopeful that the automation system will address the issue in earnest. GRA only gives approval for the relief to be granted to the employee and not the GRA going to try to I mean, reduce the taxes of the employee. It is the employer's obligation to reduce the taxes based on the relief that the person has applied for, as enshrined in the law. So basically, there is no misunderstanding, but it is only that the manual way of doing the computation that has probably created a huge burden for the controller to ensure that the employee's reliefs are deducted from the payroll system. But with digitization and automation of GRA system, it will resolve all this issue. This comes on the back of complaints raised by the Civil and Local Government Staff Association that tax reliefs filed by its members have not been effected. However, the Executive Secretary of CLOCKSAC, Isaac Bampo Ado, is optimistic that GRA would address his outfit's concerns by the scheduled date of April 2021. The government has put in this tax reliefs to also enhance our income. And it's like, because of the processes 
that are not well known, our members are not enjoying it. So we call for this workshop for GRI to come and tell us what are the processes to enable our members to enjoy this task release. They have assured us that the deadline to fill the next relief is in April 2021. So we're working towards that and ensure that in 2021, our members enjoy these tax reliefs. Clocksack organized a virtual workshop on how to file personal income tax return. Sefas Makafu Izuka, Assistant Revenue Officer at Tax Relief Department of the GRA, took the civil servants through the process. And that'll be all for business. I'm Charles Aitik. Gary L. Smith comes up next with sports this day. Gary, I'll Smith here again with the second batch of the sport. Let's get straight into the details. First of all, an emotional Azuma Nelson has put together a deep ode to his mentor and friend, the late former President Jerry John Rawlings, outlining major sacrifices Rawlings made, including getting food on credit, feeding him, and cleaning his room. So you can see that on myjoonline.com, as put together by my colleague Nathaniel Atto, um, who gives us an idea of the story as well. He says it was evident in the first line of his tribute, which read, uh, it's a day I'll never forget as Thursday, 12th November. It's a day that brought me excruciating pain after my number one fan and mentor, J.J. Rollins, passed away. Azuma, who struck a bond of friendship with the then military ruler of Ghana from the 70s during the only stages of his career, released an emotional statement which summed up what was a great bond between the two. Says J.J. Rollins hugely saved shaped my view on life, work, and many other things. I'll forever thank God for his wise and confidential counsel. Still on boxing and seasoned Ghanaian boxing ref and judge Roger Bano has been helping to build the capacity of other ring officials around the world. Ref Bano has been acting since 1998 and is one of the most consistent performers in the center of the ring from Ghana. Here's a report on his recent exploits. Ghana may not have a reigning boxing world champion, but at least an official is bringing great pride with his exploits internationally in recent times. Referee Roger Bano, who holds badges with all the world's major sanctioning bodies, has been the main trainer at an international course for ring officials put together by the Ringside Gym Global of Dubai in collaboration with the World Africa Boxing Association, and this event is happening in Dubai. Bano took the officials of various nationalities through specific areas under this basic level course which will be followed by a standard course and an advanced one in April and November of next year. The highly subscribed course is certified by the US-based Association of Professional Boxing, Commission of Boxing Associations, COFBA, and Boxers Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Union. A report by Tanzanian journalist Marunda Kitaru rates referee Bano to have delivered perhaps one of the best training seminars in recent times. Referee Bano has officiated bouts in destinations including the UK, France, South Africa, Nigeria, Togo, Namibia, and his homeland, Ghana. In football, it's match day two of the Ghana Premier League, and tomorrow there'll be some matches. 11 Wonders will be in action, Agra Great Olympics will be in action, Legon Cities as well. Now, let's feed you with some of the stats from match day one, shall we? Just to get you acquainted and ready for the second match day. So, so far, eight matches have been played. As you know, uh, the Hearts match did not happen, so did the, uh, the Liberty one, you know, which was postponed till later. 23 goals have been scored, nine wins in total, seven draws. Now we have just one home win. Remember, it was only Wafa who won at home. All the rest ended in draws. Two clean sheets have been recorded and a goal average of 2.88 is what we have as at match day one. Moving on to other statistics. And uh, hopefully we can scale this properly for you. Yes, the top five goal scorers in the Ghana Premier League from Wafa. Daniel Lomote has two goals. Kim Faisal's Kwame Prepa has two as well. Prince Okraku from 11 Wonders has one goal, as have Kwame Opoku of Asante Kotoko and Yakubu Wadudu of Kim Faisal, respectively. 
you can get more colorful images like this on our Instagram, that's at joysportsgh, and also on Twitter, joysportsgh. I'm Gary Al Smith, and that's the sport for now. Please follow us on social media. Welcome back to Joining Prime to the rest of our stories and the Chief Imam Osman Noon Shaributu and the General Secretary of the Christian Council, Dr. Cyril Fayose, are admonishing Ghanaians to guard the peace as we head to the polls in 18 days at an event dubbed Religious Leaders Action and Support for Peaceful Elections organized by the Light Foundation. They indicated the peace Ghana enjoys cannot be sacrificed for political gain. Here's a report by Mami Senior Major Thompson. For a high-stakes election, religious leaders were sure to project the importance of preserving the peace Ghana is enjoying. Both the Christian and Islamic sides agree that in order to do so, they have to educate and sensitize followers, especially the youth, to desist from fomenting trouble. Special guest of honor, Chief Imam Osman Nuhu Sharbutu, cautioned not to sacrifice the nation's peace for political gain. We are living as Muslims together with the practitioners of other faiths. We are living in peace and harmony. It is possible for us to sit around the same table at a time when nations surrounded us within the sub are uh, plunged in wars and confusion and political instability. This grace God has done to Ghana must be... General Secretary of the Christian Council, Reverend Dr. Cyril Fayosi, underscored how crucial it was for the two sides to unite for the sake of peace. According to him, it serves as a shining example for the rest of the world. Ethnicity, religion, race and other things are used to foment trouble. And if we can at least uh, have a handle on peace within the religious front, that is a major achievement. So I believe that that can infect and affect the way we do things in the country. I think uh, uh, violence doesn't solve any problem. Uh, democracy is about taking decisions and governing ourselves. So I call on all Ghanaians to go out there and exercise their franchise, go and vote. But in doing so, they should do it in peace. Security analyst Adam Bonner indicates such collaborations are helpful in killing perceptions of violence in the lead up to the election. Usually come together like this to you know forge peace because at the end of the day uh, when there is chaos one of the few places individuals run to are either the churches or the mosques because under a certain UN convention or protocol churches mosques or religious hospitals and the like are not supposed to be destroyed during war so when there is no peace, those who suffer the most, apart from the children, the vulnerable and the rest, are religious uh, leaders. And so in... The Light Foundation is also training community leaders to carry on sensitization in their communities. And that's how we wrap up Journeys Prime tonight. My name is Aisha Prime. Many thanks for watching. For more news and updates of the developing stories, log on to my journal online. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Thank <laughs> you.